Not a lot of differences between the lists. Ross does have the ninth one drop again. He does have the Gale Rider Sliver. He actually cut that uh, at the Invitational and just went to eight one drops, but he likes it again, so he's gonna play that just one of, and then he has three copies of Repetitization, as does Devin. Ross has two Hall of Triumph and one Biden of Thassa, where Devin has two Bidens, one Hall, and one Cyclonic Rift. So uh, these decks are just gonna kind of do the same thing. The mirror match to me is pretty interesting because players have to pick spots to occasionally preemptively chump because Thassa does not allow you to chump later on in the game. Mm -hmm. So the game's about building up your devotion count and, and it's about board presence, but Thassa can still allow someone who is behind to steal the game because blocking is the primary mode of interaction these decks have. Tie Binder Mage is going to come in, going to evolve the Cloth and Raptor. One damage is going to come across here for O'Donnell. You saw Mariam did not have a two drop. What that leads me to believe is that he probably has a Thassa and Nightfield Specter. Hard to keep a hand that just plays Judges Familiar on one and nothing on two or three. Yeah. Mariam already behind the eight ball a little bit here. He's going to start by attacking for one. Going to put O'Donnell down to 18. There's a Muta Vault, there's a Thassa. That was very, very important for Ross. O'Donnell draws a land for the turn. I don't think he had one to start with, so I think that was very important for Devin. Although Devin's draw is pretty close to ideal here. One drop, two drop, Thassa, and Master Waves in hand. Again, I don't think that O'Donnell had the third land. Actually, I take it back, he did, because there's a Mutavolt, so uh, his draw might just be perfect. Mary, I'm going to put the top card to the bottom here. I'm going to take a draw. And let's see what Ross can do, if he can keep up here. Not having a two drop certainly stinks. Having a Thassa on three is quite good, but he might just be too far behind just because of what Devin's start is. You almost feel like Ross has to get Thassa turned on and attacking this turn mm -hmm. to be able to keep up with the quality of the draw that Devin has. So we're talking Island Nightfield Spectre to turn that bad boy on. Or one drop, two drop, mm -hmm. or something along those lines, but yeah. Well, it doesn't start with the Muta Vault, that's for sure. Here's a Biden of Thassa. In comes the Judge's Familiar. That's going to deal one that also draw Miriam a card. And he's working his way towards Devotion. Just not quite sure if Biden of Thassa is going to be quite good enough here. Zodan is going to untap. He's going to scry here with his Thassa. Take a look at his hand again. He's got a Biden of Frostmore, a Master of Waves over there. Top card is going to go to the bottom. Can he find a fourth land? I think he already had, he has the fourth land. Here's a Master. So time to trigger Devotion. Evolution of the Cloud from Raptor is complete. And there are five Elemental Tokens. And now here comes Thassa, Cloudfin, and the Tidebinder Mage. This is, uh, this is how you draw it up if you're monoblue. This one is known in the business as the Nuts. Yep. Now, there is the possibility, let's see Ross's list here really quick. Okay, there's no Cyclonic Rift. I was gonna say, if you found Nykthos plus Cyclonic Rift, yep. maybe there's a chance, yep. but without access to that card to his list, I believe he is doomed. Yeah, you know, Donald's the one with the Cyclonic Rift. He has one in his deck, and Miriam has none this particular weekend. And you can see Ross knows he's in some serious trouble now. How does he work his way out of this situation? I'm not even sure it's possible. He does have the Nykthos, which is nice. Just does not have the Rift to go along with it. He will tap that for what looks to be four blue mana. Maybe, maybe not. You have to imagine Judges Miller's probably got to get in here to draw him a card. Well, if he has an answer to Master Ways, if he has a rapid hybridization, then he's still, yeah, he's still facing lethal next turn if Devin is able to turn Thassa back on. Yeah. But that's asking a lot. He may not necessarily be able to do it. Yep. Ross is in a ton of trouble, though. Not impossible for him to get out of this spot. This, this can actually be managed. Decisions, decisions here for Miriam. Standard Open champion. Just a couple weeks ago when we were in Providence, he had a great one with Mono Blue there. Only lost one match during the standard portion. Lost to a Mono Black Devotion deck. Not a lot of people had Mono Blue in the room in Providence. He was one of the few. Right. But he's running into it right now. Gonna tap a blue. And you can tell, for someone who's played Mono Blue Devotion this much, very, very unsure of himself. Well, this is a tough spot. I mean, there's not a whole lot of cards to pull him out of this. Yeah. And when we do watch Ross play, be it this deck or Elves, he certainly 
you know, he thinks this plays through, but you can tell he's been in a lot of situations before, so he knows exactly what he wants to accomplish. Right now, it seems very uneasy about what to play around. Is there anything I can do to get myself out of this situation? Am I just posturing? So now he's going to, what he does is he plays Judge Familiar, turns Thassa on, makes it unblockable, and now he's going to come across here for six. Five of which unblockable, and heck, even the Flyer's unblockable too. So two triggers from the Biden, hit one, hit two. One of those cards was Rapid Hybridization. So that gives him some play here. If Devin just goes untap, attack you, then it's possible he could use Rapid Hybridization inside of combat to turn off Thassa. Correct. Chump block something. And we got a game going. This is all predicated on Devin getting sloppy, however. Yes. The, Ross is setting a trap here. Now, that being said, if you're out as your opponent getting sloppy, you have to play to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose your out could also just be hope you have all lands in your hand. So, something like that. It's not impossible, but it is certainly very difficult. Devin going to put the top card to the bottom. Mystery card coming here. It's a copy of Cyclonic Rift. Not a bad one of in this situation. Devin, of course, doesn't really need it to win. He's going to play a Frostborn Weird pre-combat to make sure his Thassa stays on. He's going to activate, make this unblockable, come in with everybody. And Miriam is going to pick up his permanent, so that rapid hybridization is not going to get the job done. So Devin O'Donnell is going to win game number one here over Ross Merriam in the Mono Blue Devotion Mirror. Very sharp play there from Devin, too. Yeah. Just making sure that he had some insurance piece of devotion back before he did anything else to make sure that Thassa, nothing could go wrong with Thassa. Mm -hmm. We'll take a look at the sideboards here. We're going to start with Miriam. I have a match we're going to run into a lot of counter spells here in just a moment. There's one Dispel, three copies of Gainsay, two Negate, two Dissolve, a Cyclonic Rift, Claustrophobia, two copies of Domestication, a Biden of Thassa, a Jace Architect of Thought, and a Jace Memory Adept. Very reminiscent of what Ross won with in Providence. I expect to see the Gainsays come in. I have seen him port Dissolve in this match when he played against Sam Pardee at the Season 2 Invitational Columbus. Um, I expect to see the Rift come in. Claustrophobia is not bad at providing devotion, maybe even locking up a Thassa, depending on how things go. But the easy one to bring in here is domestication. It is a haymaker in this matchup. Yeah. It's a, it basically yeah. takes everything that is in Thassa, and breaks up Master of Waves, it's just excellent. Duke and Costa have domestication mains this, main this weekend. We saw Duke's list have two main, two board. Not exactly sure the numbers for Costa here, but uh, Miriam without any of the main deck and only two in the sideboard. It's interesting to see this deck uh, de-emphasizing Jace Architect the thought too. Yeah. That's a card we used to see, you know, Two of in the main and two more in the board, or something, you know, one and two splits. And now we see zero copies in the main and one copy in the sideboard. Ross's list here. I don't exactly recall Reed's list, but it was definitely way lighter on Jason's than we've seen in the past. The big question is how many domestications does O'Donnell have? Also, two in his list alongside a Cyclonic Rift, two dispels. A Curse of the Spine, three gain saves, two chase memory adept, two dissolve, two negate. And I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of the same sideboarding. The counter spells and the domestication, probably the additional cyclonic rift as well. As these players do continue sideboarding here, a little chit chat for the Mono Blue Devotion Mirror. We will talk very briefly about SCG game night coming in September and beginning every Wednesday. Yep. Uh, again, every Wednesday starting in September. We're going to be sending out prize kits to participating stores and tournament organizers, two pins and eight foils each week. We're going to be giving out new pins and foils each month. Again, every Wednesday, we wanted to give a little more grassroots organized play support. Uh, these formats can be run. It's whatever the store wants to do. So you want to run sanctioned, non-sanctioned, draft, casual formats, whatever. Uh, just have people show up to your store and play Magic. Hashtag for game night is hashtag game night. And you can sign up for this and find out more information at sarcygames.com slash game night. Bug your TO. It's pretty simple. You want this, bug them. It's not hard to get. And now it's worldwide. And you can sign up now, starcygames.com slash game night. Sign up. Any emails, questions that you have, game night at starcitygames.com. It's simple, it's easy, and it's going to be a lot of fun in September. And Star City Games has a very professional and well-staffed organized play support team. So if you've never done it before, don't worry. The website's easy to navigate. You know, if you need to contact someone directly, it's easy to do. So uh, don't hesitate. Get your store signed up for this. That's part of the reason we mention people like Callie, Jared Silva, and the gang is because they are unbelievable what they do. Yeah. So very, very good. So efficient at getting these tournaments up and running and always very, very smooth. Ross Merriam, number eight on our player championship leaderboard here for season number three. Again, he is, you know, about 30 points behind the main people in the race, Joe Lissette and Alex Bertanzini, but all it takes is one nice weekend for him, and he can get himself right back in the thick of things. 
it's not hard to do. Yeah, Ross is interesting. He's one of our the most dominant open series performance that we have that doesn't have a lot of high profile Pro Tour Grand Prix resumes. It's yeah. almost all been done in the Open Series mm -hmm. Invitationals, but he's consistently successful at these events. And he's consistently successful playing the same decks. Yeah. You know, before he was playing Bottom Blue Ocean when Blue Air Delver was a thing, he's won an Open with that before. Uh, and he was playing that for a very, very long time. He's always playing Elves in Legacy, it seems. Sometimes he switches off once in a while, but for the most part, he is always playing Cabo Elves. And in standard, he's been playing Mono Blue Devotion for about as long as it's been a thing. Magic's a really hard game. It's really, really hard to play well, and there's no substitute for expertise. Yeah. So all other things being equal, I usually advocate saying and uh, kind of playing the same deck if you can help it. Sometimes the metagame can get too bad for a particular thing. You know, th that definitely comes up, but... Sometimes the deck can be too good. Yeah. That you have to play Callblade, for example. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, the deck is just too good. But by and large, assuming things are at something resembling equilibrium, you should play whatever you think you play the best, in my opinion. Both players can lay out their starting seven here. We'll be underway in just a moment. We'll see if Ross Merriman can tie things up or if Devin O'Donnell will move on to 5-0 and o here rather quickly. It looks like Merriam will keep. Again, his deck list very reminiscent to what he did win in Providence with. O'Donnell will take a look at his seven cards. He is not happy. He will send it back. So Merriam will wait patiently, just like we will here in the booth. One thing I'm curious of, and I haven't really looked at M15 very much. The whole thing just got released, I think, yesterday. Um, I, haven't, I haven't really taken like the in-depth look yet, to see if Mono Blue gets anything new. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't kind of passed over the file yet with that kind of lens to yeah. it. Yeah, yep. I'm more interested about cards, kind of in their abstract functionality than rather how they fit into a particular standard deck. Because the metagame is going to be completely different. Yeah, it's a mistake people commonly make about getting too hung up on things as they exist now when the most likely outcome is things are just entirely different. Yeah. And with how many good cards are in M15, things are going to change. And I feel like for a change drastically, normally you see the big shift when, you know, a big set rotates out. Mm -hmm. And then the new set rotates in. Of course, change is inevitable at that point. But I actually feel like M15 is going to bring along with it just some sweeping changes. For sure. And it just even something as innocuous as the Apocalypse Painlands do a lot to potentially open up deck construction that hasn't been available before. Yeah. You see things like, you know, Jeff Hoogland for months were playing these bug decks where the mana was just unacceptable. Yep. Now, with the Scrylands filled out and you have access to land war waste and, and so forth, you might be able to really make that deck happen. And he certainly gave it his best shot, but the mana yeah. was horrible. Yeah. How many forests can you play in your Nightvale Spider deck? The answer ideally is zero, you know what I mean? He had, yeah. But he had to play a lot because he's trying to play with Silver Carrotted and do play with Kior on time and all this stuff. Now, you know, you don't really have to play Gilgates anymore or basic lands you don't want to play. You can just cast your stuff. Nick Miller doing a fantastic feature on Jeff Hoogland earlier this week on the Select Side of Star City Games. If you guys haven't had the opportunity to read it, you can check it out. Why he does things the way he does them, why he loves brewing, when he got started playing Magic, and why he's very excited about Court of Calling. Now, for, if, for the way that Jeff builds decks, I think Court is right up his alley. His bread and butter. Yeah. Definitely going to take a second mulligan. He's going down to five here. One card that could potentially go in the deck is, is Illusory Angel. There's also, you know, the new Jace, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. I actually think uh, Brian Kibler, I think, is the one who actually brought new Jace to my attention as far as it being something that can go into Mono Blue Devotion. Because, you know, one of the cards that, that's kind of weird in Mono Blue Devotion is Jace Architect of Thought. Yeah, it's good against the aggressive strategies, and, you, you know, the... They use it as kind of a card drawing engine against the control decks, but it's not the most efficient card drawing engine, all things being honest. Mono Blue Devotion would much rather pay four mana for Boomerang than four mana look at three cards and your opponent gets to split them up. Yeah. You know, if we're talking about immediate impact, uh, I think the the New Jays can potentially be a better add for that build. And while also providing a healthy amount of devotion as well. Yeah. That could be where we go. It's not really a raw card count deck. It's looking for specific tools. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Basically, sleight of hand, which is what the new chase allows you to do, is probably not that far off from just drawing the cards. As opposed to a deck like Esper, which is all about raw card count, you need to be drawing more cards because you need to be like making all your land drops and getting to six mana. For Mono Blue Devotion, look at two cards, set one on top, and chase minusing is not that far apart. You know, certainly relative to the popular sentiment about how underpowered the new chase is. Five cards here for O'Donnell. He's going to keep Marion with no one drop. 
So Devin with an island into a judge's familiar. Marion will take a draw here. You have to imagine he has a two, and he does. It'll be a tied binder mage to pass the turn back. Get the devotion train online. Judge familiar coming into the red zone. Miriam going to take first blood, go down to 19. Well, Donald just going to pass the turn back. Looks like he does have multiple copies of Thassa along with the Master of Waves in hand. Miriam will attack for two. O'Donnell will go down to 18. Miriam with a third land, and there is a Thassa. No gain say there, so fortunate for Ross as O'Donnell will attack here for one. It's an even game at 18s. And there is a Thassa for him. So let's see if Ross can get his Thassa turned on right away as he does scry or be able to sort of advance his board while leaving up Counterspell Magic, which is another good way for him to progress this game. There's an island. This is a Master of Waves. That's not bad. No, this is not bad. <laughs> Doesn't turn off Thassa, <laughs> but he will get, you know, 10 points of power on the table. Well, Donald's going to take a look at the top card of his deck right now via the God of the Sea. That card's going to go to the bottom. Fresh card coming. It's another copy of Thassa. I think he has multiples of those in his hand right now and already has one in play. Yeah, you can see him thumbing between two, maybe even three cops of that. So just a boring old attack with Judge's Familiar. And now here is a Master of Ways for him. Devotion will be a three. Mary will look at the top card. That one's going to go to the bottom. He will take a draw, and all it takes is one copy of Domestication for this to be a wrap. And that's what that's going to be. That's going to go to Ross's side. That'll pump up his elementals, and everybody's going to come into the red zone now. You see Ross with kind of a... Uh, bemused nodding of the head there as he tapped his fifth land for yeah. domestication. Yeah, there, there she is. That's, That's what we're looking for. That's yeah. the draw we're looking <laughs> for. <laughs> That'll bring a smile to his face as the Provident Standard Open champion does even it up rather quickly here against Devin O'Donnell. Sometimes the, this matchup is very interactive. A lot of attacking and blocking going on. And sometimes it is just two people doing their thing and not a lot of interaction. And that Some was... That was one of the second games. Sometimes you just get your, key, your teeth kicked in. Yeah, it happens. That just happens. That's some of the allure of magic. Sometimes you just lose. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, we've talked about our Acorn Mystic token as an addition to the creature collection. We now have our Worm token as well. Wearing a hat and going fishing. Yeah, this is another really adorable, kind of human-like, but still animal creature we have as part of our token series. Wearing a hat and going fishing, as you mentioned. Not quite sure. Uh, what he's looking for, but you can get this and more. <laughs> he's looking for that guy in the water. Yeah, that's what he wants. The tokens come with any order you see uh, from June 23rd to October 3rd through the website, and then the deck boxes and play mats and so forth will be available through the usual channels. Just another fun addition. This is the 5 5 worm token, mostly for Advent of the Worm, but back in my day, worm tokens were 6 6s and they looked a lot more fierce. They were for Roar of the Worm. They were. We're old. Or Crush of Worms. Made three of them. I did. I remember that card very well because your friend Eugene Harvey knocked me out of playing for top eight at Grand Prix Cleveland with Crush of Worms How many when I was 16. How many did he make? I think six Okay. with his wake deck mm -hmm. that he played in that block tournament. Yep, Eugene, a master. He was much better than me then and probably still better than me now. It's very sad. I, I get that Eugene's resume, and I'm biased, you know, we went to the same middle school, same high school, mm -hmm. been friends for, for forever. I understand his resume is a tad shy of Hall of Fame worthy, but for him to basically receive no noise every year, it's a bit of a shame. For a while there, he was one of the best, if not the best American Magic players. What actually makes me sadder it, more than anything is that if, if I were to go around this particular room or any room in the open search, I think, and just say, hey, do you know who Eugene Harvey is? No Most one people knows. would be like, nope. I have no, no idea knows. who you're talking about. He is one of the best American Magic players or best Magic players simply put, of all time. Yeah. Oh, well. The game has passed him by. Uh, I, I think that if Eugene cared to, he would be back on the Pro Tour. Probably pretty fast. Wailing on these people in no time. Yeah, probably, probably pretty quickly. But he's kind of got his own thing going on now. So it doesn't really allow for much time uh, to play Magic. But one of the greats. Is he actually as soft-spoken as he appears? Yeah. OK. I have, so, like, there are people who are soft-spoken in public, and then, like, you know, with your, when you're just with your friends, it's just a bunch of trash talk, and you guys are having a good time, and it's like, man, I sure wish Eugene talked more, and you're just like, oh, he talks. But he just seems like a soft-spoken guy. Didn't yeah, he's, really he's always been always an introverted dude. Yeah. He could play some spells in the right order, though, that's for sure. Yeah. He was really good at that. Game three is where we are headed now, my friends. Mono Blue Devotion Mirror seems like a very popular deck. Three of the best players in the room starting off 4-0 with it, and Reed Duke, Matt Costa, and Ross Merriam. 
And hey, whoever wins this match also uh, going to be 5-0 and with Mono Blue. So it doesn't have to be Ross. It could certainly be Devin O'Donnell, who has shown some chops here, even though he did mulligan to five last game. Yeah, game one, he played sharp. He did have a commanding lead the whole time, but he also knew what Ross's outs were. Played around them accordingly. Yeah. All you can ask for. Mary, I'm going to take a mulligan down. It looks like six here. Magic does have this very what have you done for me lately sort of vibe to the to the culture, unfortunately. Absolutely. So people, people will get lost in the shuffle. Not everyone is a historian like myself or you. I don't know if you look at Magic history as much as I do, but I always, uh, you know, back when I was playing competitively, you know, over those eight or nine years that I did so, I was just reading and, you know, looking at deck lists and everything. I, I, I loved always knowing who everyone was. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where I, I guess I'm sort of a de facto historian at this point, but it was never, uh, I was never trying to engage with it because I was specifically that concerned about the, the history of the game. I just cared about everything so much that I consumed every piece of content I could get my hands on. Sure. So I guess kind of by definition, I just knew who a lot of people were, even, even though, you know, like you're uh, like, someone like Morgan Douglas who wasn't someone who was, you know, had a lot of Pro Tour success or anything, but it's just like, yeah, he just wins a PTQ every season. Yeah. And is affiliated with, you know, the guys in the Baltimore area who are good at Magic. Yeah. But just never really broke through. You just know names. Yeah. yeah. And I always enjoyed, that's one of the things I've always enjoyed about Magic, is just knowing names. Yeah. You know, Adam Snook last round, I just know, because he's friends with Costa and Dave Shields and Reed Duke and all those guys from the area. No one drop for either player to begin things here. And Devin O'Donnell does have a two, and it is a Frostburn weird that he will play. Miriam will draw a card. Just going to pass the turn back. See if he's leaving up some counter magic. A gain say it looks like. I don't see if O'Donnell's going to play into it. Here comes Frostmore. It's going to be a pump, so he is not going to play into this, it looks like. But Ross might be in the situation where he just has to counter whatever gets played. Here's another copy of Frostmore weird. Yep. Yep. Although Devin may have wanted to order his spells a little differently there because sometimes Syncopate hangs out in these lists. Yeah, that's true. There's Mutavolk going to pass the turn back. I imagine Ross is trying to snipe a Nightfall Spectre or a Thassa with that, but wasn't able to. So Dino draws a copy of Judge's Familiar for the turn. And Devin's totally happy in that spot if that, that Frostburn Weird resolves. Of course. He's got a lot of damage coming through. I don't have to cast anything else. So Dino's going to take a moment here. Figure out exactly how he wants to move forward in this game. He's going to start by attacking. We'll see if there are any pumps. Here's one maybe. Yes. Two. Three. Will Miriam make a move? Does have a rapid hybrid in his hand. I don't know if he has interest in making that exchange or not. He also has domestication hanging out over there. This is one of those spots where it seems so obvious that Ross has counter spells and all of Devin's resources are valuable. He's saying, okay, I'm just going to hit you for a bunch of damage. Uh, but I think, I think Ross might be happy with the game going that way. You know, that might be the that might be what's interesting about the situation is he's like, OK, I, I would be thrilled if you just, you know, spend your turn pumping four times or pumping three times because I might not even have a counter spell. Yeah. So rapid hybridization takes down Frostman Weir. Going to give O'Donnell a 3-3 three, three, and the Judge Familiar after combat. Mary's going to play his fourth lane. It's a copy of Nykthos. And what's he going to deploy? He's going to play Domestication on that Frog Lizard before passing the turn back. Not the most exciting domestication target, all things being honest. There are some juicier hits. That's not so bad. The big one he probably wanted was that knife hill spectrum. Still needs to get something started with devotion and just a board presence in general. So yeah. I agree with you. It is not the optimal target for that domestication, but you can't just say go on turn four. Yeah. Can't always get what you want. Miriam deep in the tank here. As most of O'Donnell's cards are in play right now. You see five islands, Nightfell, Spectre, Frostburn, Weird, and a Judge's Familiar. Miriam with the domestication on a Frog Lizard from a Rapid Hybridization. Two islands, a Nykthos, and a Mutaval. He has a lot of cards in his hand. He seems to convert these into play. Let's see if he can get himself back in the game. He's going to start by playing a Master of Waves. And of course, this is a little bit risky, opening himself up to domestication. And he might not be able to do anything about that as O'Donnell quickly untaps and takes a draw here. And the slow reveal, one of my favorites. Usually a sign they don't have anything, but, yeah, there, are, yeah. <laughs> but there are some big draws. Yeah. The slow peel back, one of my favorites. 
I call that the Alex Mazelton special. Yeah. Have you ever been slow peeled by someone who's just just wailing on you? Yes. It is really bad. Josh Rabbits. <laughs> uh, that's the perfect person to have do it, too. I have. Josh hey. Rabbits and I have had some interesting interactions over our course of playing Magic. <laughs> that is great. There was a game uh, at Grand Prix Chicago the first time I played him in 2005 where um, he was basically beating my brains in with a Nagao, and I was beginning to stabilize. This is Kamigawa Block Limited. I was beginning to stabilize like my blue-red deck. And, you know, the gal, the, the four mana three three. Yeah, yeah, four mana three three. The best uncommon in the set, the best non rare in the set, basically. Yeah, basically, yeah. basically was back then. And he, I was beginning to finally, you know, work my way through everything he was doing and stabilizing. And he had like a very good white X deck. And, you know, then he like draws his card for the turn. He's kind of huffing and puffing. And I'm just like, you know, what? And he's like, I didn't want to show you this and plays a Voyage of Cleansing Fire, kills all my stuff. And I'm just like, are you kidding? He's like, I didn't want to show you it. I didn't want, I'm, I'm dead. Yeah. What are you talking about? Well, you know, it's just good to, to strive for perfect play. You never want to get ahead yeah. of yourself. He also, in, I remember in game three, did like the slow keep and then played something on every, like, go like two, three, four, five, six, kill you. So he did like the, uh, I don't know if I'm going to keep, oh, I have the perfect hand, kill you. Well, I, I actually think there's something to that, you know? I, it's I, an amateur's move. I don't think that's true. Give off a lot of information if you're like, yeah, I'll keep, or whatever. If snap you only it off. Have, snap it off. If you only have it hot when you're thinking about things, then it's pretty rough. That's a recipe to get wastelanded on turn one a bunch. Who do you think was laughing on turn six? It was him as he was beating my brains. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I would laugh too. The attack from Night Vale Spectre reveals a dispel, which is not so great. It could be okay. Nykthos does come down as well. The uh, last card that Devin has left over in all of this is a Cyclonic Rift in his He hand. actually has it in his hand? Okay. Yes. That was and the fear. That would dispel backup that he has off the Nightfield Spider. Now it gives him a lot of control on how he wants to play this game. Yeah, that's the green light. Rift's such an interesting card in this deck, you know, because, you know, there are a lot of games where Rift wins where you, you remember that, like, man, Cyclonic Rift is the card that won that game, but it's not a card they play a lot of. There are one, sometimes two cards throughout their 75. The deck needs to play a lot of permanents for Devotion, of course. So yeah. you can only afford so many slots along those lines, but Cyclonic Rift is a really powerful one of. Beautiful going to go active here. Miriam looks like he's going to come into the red zone. And he will. So again, it's going to be a 3-3 three, three because of Master Away. So this will be an attack for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 points of damage. It's a very aggressive attack from Ross here. Devin has the option of just putting the weird in front of the master and saying, all right, make a move. Wrong. Pro red. Correct. You cannot. That makes this a much safer attack. Yes. That being said, I can still see bombs. Devotion three, four, five, six. I think he doesn't want to put the domestication back in Ross's hands. OK. I think that's what this is all about. Okay. He's still eating up Ross's turn here, potentially. This is still a pretty big beating. Yeah, this is still a big beating. But I think that's just, you know, he wants to just keep that Night Vale Spectre going here. Yeah. Yeah. So he did have the option to overload there, but elects not to. He doesn't even get his own creature back in his hand. It's a token he loses for forever, so. He saw Ross thought about casting Rapid Hybridization and then realizing, oh, I can't. Now he will try. And this is going to get dispelled. There's, a, there's another copy of Rapid Hybrid. All right. Very important for him to get that Night Vale Spectre off the table and hope that Devin starts bricking. Yeah, Night Vale's a total runaway in this spot. Yeah. So that's an ugly bit of resources there that Ross needs to use up, but he's got to do something. So Frog is going to come into play. Of course, that one's summoning sick. Devin draws an island. If you're Ross right now, you need, you need your opponent to miss for a couple turns so you can get reestablished. Well, Ross has some power in his hand. I mean, he does have, at the minimum, that Master of Waves that got sent back. Looks like he drew another copy of Master. So Master's going to be redeployed here. Again, three more Elementals are going to come into play. You have to um, eh. Yeah, I was going to say you have to imagine he's going to attack here, but I don't think he's going to because the two Blue Devotion Domestications providing actually is probably more important. For sure. He can make that attack next turn. If he yeah. plays a Master that goes uncontested, then his tokens are three power, as is the Frog Lizard. He has a ton of extra resources, then he can make that trade. A slow peel. A reaffirming head nod. I think it's a real one or a fake one? It either means he drew something very good or nothing. Yeah. It's not an average quality draw. Yeah. 
Ross's head nod was a good one. It's a good one. Hey, yeah, it's he's, Thassa. Yeah, he's playing it straight. <laughs> <laughs> Thassa's a real good one here. No fake head nod. Very real from Devin O'Donnell. He's going to deploy the God of the Sea. Is it lethal? You can activate Nykthos for two, three, four. So you can make some things unblockable here. So this is me five blue mana. Yeah, he gets a hit with the flyer and make the weird and the token unblockable. Mm -hmm. But it's not lethal yet. No. Now the big question, of course, is how does Miriam overcome this? Well, there's is there any risk of him being killed on the way back here? And he said that's what he needs to be careful of. Two, huh? three, four, because Thassa's not on. This is shields down if yeah. Ross can put together the damage. Miriam draws a card for the turn. That's an island. And Nykthos is net neutral on mana, so yep. that is no help here. Trying to overload a rift or anything along those lines. If he plays another Master of Waves, that means he has 12, 14 coming across. Not enough. Elementals become three power creatures. Three times three is nine. 10, 11 for Master, 13, 14, uh, 11, 14 damage with the Beast token, so that is 14. As you mentioned, Nykthos is net mana, so not being able to generate some sort of crazy advantage there. Again, Merriman was in a position where he needed O'Donnell to probably, truthfully, just brick one more turn. Yeah. The affirming nod from Devin there was legitimate. Yeah. It was the best. Yeah. And between that and Domestication, I think those are probably the two best cards you could have drawn that turn, but I think you could actually argue that Thassa was a better draw than Domestication last turn. Because Thassa actually just closed the game out. Yeah. And also, Ross does have a lot of redraws to it. Yeah. Ross is without rapid hybridization. He's used three of them this game. Two of which to battle over a Night Veil Spectre. Yeah, taking that lump from Night Veil Spectre was, that was the big one. So now Mary was trying to figure out, all right, what, is there any way that I can do anything here? And it looks quite difficult. This is maybe another one of those spots where Ross needs to try to set the trap where there's at least a mistake for Devin to make. Yeah. We saw this in game one. He did have a setup where if Devin got sloppy, Ross would have taken the game. Yep. Is there any error that I can force on my opponent? He's certainly trying. And Ross, what, what Ross is looking at in his hand right now is his one Cyclonic Rift in his sideboard that he's drawn. I think what he's trying to figure out is how, what's the best way for me to use this? We're going to go bouncing the Frog Lizard. Okay. And now he passes the turn back. So he's trying to set a trap on something. Yeah, making the weird unblockable and dumping mana into it is still lethal. Yeah. So he is trying to, again, induce some sort of mistake. Well, Donald drew something that matters. He's tapping mana very quickly. Now he's slowing down a little bit, trying to figure out, okay, what trap can my opponent be setting? The nice thing about Mono Blue, I guess you can say, is that you can put them on a range of instants. Yeah. What could these cards be? Going to make this unblockable, attack you, pump. That's going to do it. Just a master of waves, and he will extend the hand. So, Devin O'Donnell is going to win this match over Ross Merriam. Two games to one. The model Blue Devotion Mirror goes to the player on the left. Yep. Ross did his best there to, to shuck and jive, but that Thassa is just a huge beating. Yeah, the fun thing will be now, you know, when Ross goes back and watches this match, and I imagine we'll go back and watch it at some point as well, too, is what was the best use for Cyclonic Rift there? Was there a best use for Cyclonic Rift there? Well, it at least puts Devin in a spot where... You know, if that attack goes wrong that turn, Devin loses. Sure. So there's at least some, you know, maybe he tries to find out some, some, some defensive approach there because Ross doesn't have a thought of his own. So Devin doesn't have to necessarily go for it that turn. Mm -hmm. He draws something that allows him to take a safer angle. Maybe he doesn't go for the kill and Ross gets some sort of draw. So uh, I, I think the, the play that Ross made there gives Devin the maximum 
amount of chance and rationalization to not go for the kill there, and then Ross has a shot. Yeah, maybe he overthinks things. Yeah. You know, who knows what ends up happening there. You know, I was thinking, is it possible that he's Cyclonic Rifts back Thassa and then Devin is a little bit gun-shy and casting it? But I think Devin might be just forced to cast it. Yeah, I imagine, you know, in that spot that he draws Jace Architect of Thought. Okay. Or Master of Waves. Okay. Maybe he plays that instead of going for the kill that turn. Yeah. And then Ross has a shot. Yep. Yeah. 